special guest uh, flown in from the country of Florida. We are so glad to have Pastor Corey Demo back. Corey, we love you. Uh, your smell has not left this place yet. We still smell you in different places of the building. And we just want you to know you are welcome here. Give me one. Give me one. Amen. God bless you. That ain't no thing. Hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, it's so great to be back. Uh, for those of you who are newer here, I was a pastor here. I served here for about 16 years, and this is home. Uh, I became a man here. I'm still working on that part. Uh, but the truest thing Hook has said today is the country of Florida. That is a very accurate statement. Uh, before I preach uh, in a minute, I just want a couple things. First of all, I bring greetings on behalf of my wife, Rebecca, and my daughter, Madison. They, they didn't come on this trip with me. Um, Rebecca is disappointed she's not here. Madison hates that she's not here. Uh, so, she, I, Dad, I can't believe you're going to Bellevue Christian Center and I'm not going to be there. Um, something else I wanted to just give you a real, real brief info on. Um, the founding pastor at the church that I'm at, they do tour a trip every year, either the footsteps of Paul or the footsteps of Jesus, a 10-day trip to look at the life and the world of the Bible. It's a great discipleship opportunity. In 2021, two years from now, uh, Rebecca and I are going to co-lead that trip to Israel. Uh, and we, we thought it would be really cool if my church family from Florida and my church family from Nebraska maybe came together. And so we made specific information and flyers for Omaha. So if in two years you would like to join Rebecca and I and some of our church family in Florida, we're going to be taking a 10-day trip in March to uh, the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Sea of Galilee. It's going to be a life-changing opportunity. And so we made information specific to, to Omaha, and those are at the Info Center. And so uh, you're welcome to join us, and we would love for you to, to be a part of that and experience that with us as well. Um, and uh, lastly, I just want to dispel a rumor. Uh, there is a rumor that I came from Florida, and I brought tornadoes with me, and I'm a storm chaser. Uh, but I want to just clear that up, that the, the storm chased us. We did not chase the storm. Uh, I, I don't know if maybe I just shouldn't stay away from Nebraska because crazy things happen every time. Uh, but I came back to play golf with some guys uh, from this church. We've been doing this trip for a long time, and, and we got a picture. It was about three miles away. We got to see a real-life tornado. That's not Photoshopped. Uh, we have some funny videos. Some of us thought it was safe to take pictures, and some of us went downstairs. Um, <laughs> But it's never a dull moment. I do want to clarify, many of you have asked and are just really worried. We did wait 20 minutes and we did finish the round. So it didn't stop us the whole time. Uh, I didn't fly to Omaha uh, from Florida to Wuss out. So uh, we finished. Um, and then also I brought from my friend Gary's with me from Florida. He's part of our church. And then Joseph, uh, I don't know where he went. Pastor Joseph, is he went to the bathroom or something? Okay. Um, pastor Joseph is my youth pastor. He's also the same pastor who preached at your youth conference uh, a couple of months ago. He's with me. In fact, he's going to, I'm going to have him kind of help me preach this message if that's okay with you. You guys ready to do this? Thanks for letting me have uh, just the opportunity to be home. And last, you weren't here at the 9 o'clock service, but at the 9 o'clock service, the fire alarms went off and we all had to evacuate. True story. Never happened. So we're just hoping we can just go uh, the next, you know, 32 or 3 minutes and just be able to stay here the whole time. Um, so we're going to pray about that. Uh, bow your heads with me if you would. God, thanks so much for the opportunity to be home. Um, God, I pray that we wouldn't have any fire alarms or tornado warnings or anything like that today. God, I pray that your anointing would come on me. I pray that you would speak uh, what we need to hear today, that you would move me and Joseph out of the way. It's not about us. It's about what you want to say. And God, I just pray that your anointing would be on Coach Frost as he recruits and trains those men in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord answers prayers. Uh, I need you. Uh, just if you're not familiar with my style or how I work, I do better when you uh, participate with me. So if you can verbally give me feedback, nod, uh-huh, yeah, that's good if you like it. Or just boo me or throw stuff if you don't. Uh, either is good. But um, the, the more in input you give me and the more you participate with me, the better this message will be. So really, if this message isn't very good, it's your fault. Um, so I need you to say this with me. I am. There you go. With some conviction. God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. I want to talk about that for a little bit. I know you guys are in a, in a 
series called Struggles. We're going to talk about one of the struggles that I think affects every person. It doesn't matter how old. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter if you're searching for God, don't want to have anything to do with God. If you've been following God your whole life, something that I think all of us struggle with, and I think it gets in the way a lot. But I want to start with this truth, this verse. See, Paul's writing to a, a new city that doesn't know the way of Jesus, that doesn't know how to live, but they're interested. And so Paul's job was to teach crazy like heathen, wild and out cities, how to be the church and how to be Christians. And he's reminding them of something really important. And he's telling them a really important truth that's going to help them be who they're made to be. And he's telling them that they are God's masterpiece, it says in Ephesians 2. Some versions say handyman's, uh, handiwork. Some, peop- some versions say you are God's handiwork. You are God's workmanship. But you are here. You are who you are. You are here on this planet. And you were designed by God as a masterpiece. There's never been any like you. There never will be. And God thought uh, in advance and he thought ahead to know exactly what time in history, what family, what culture, what country to put you in. Because he has something great for you to do while you are here on this earth. And so it says, you're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. You're not an accident. You're not a whim. Even if you were unplanned, even if somebody tried to abort you, you are here. And that means God has a plan for you. And you are created for what you were created for. It says right here, we're going to look at this. It says, you were created to do good works. You were created to do something great. You were put on this earth to do good works. But not just about yourself. It says that you were created to do works which God went ahead of you in advance and pre-prepared what you were supposed to do. Your, your, your purpose and your life is not just about you. It's about, it's about making the world a better place. It's about doing something significant for the kingdom. And so you have a, pl- uh, you have a place in this world that, that you are a masterpiece. God said, I'm going to paint a masterpiece and it's going to look good and there's never going to be anything like it. And, and that was you. And we live in a world and a culture that is telling us a lot of other things, and you are a masterpiece. But let me just tell you, God knew exactly what he was doing when he created you. God knew exactly, he knew it was time. And he already had a, something marked out ahead of you. And he says, now's the time to bring him into the world. Now's the time to bring her into the world. Even though it's crazy, even though it's broken, even though since I gave you free will, you've been defining good and evil for yourself and you suck at it, it's still going to put you in this culture. And I'm going to show that there's still a kingdom that can come here on earth as it is in heaven, that there's still a light in a dark place. It's time for you to come. And I, I know what I'm doing. You belong here. Yeah. You're a masterpiece. Not only are you a masterpiece, I have something great for you. Not only do I have something great for you, I pre-thought it. I'm a genius. I pre-thought it, and here's what I want you to do. But I want to talk about what gets in the way of us living out being a masterpiece, what cuts in on us doing those good works and not fulfilling and, and, and fitting in our purpose. And it's, it's this thing, it's a struggle in our relationship with Jesus that I think everybody faces. And I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is even the people that were closest to Jesus, his most closest disciples, they struggled with it. So if you struggle with it, guess what? Good news, you're not alone. The bad news is we may never stop struggling with it. But it, the, cross is, the cross is the biggest expectation that we just keep reading Jesus every day, right? The ground is level at the cross. We're all broken people. So here's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. I want to talk about the struggle or I want to talk about the curse of comparison. I want to talk about the curse of comparison. You ever have something or get a new toy or a new vehicle or maybe a bow or you get to go on a vacation? You ever have something and you're looking at what you have or you're enjoying it and you, it's fine and you love it and you're content until you turn and notice what somebody else has? Like you get that truck, you're like, I love my new truck. And then somebody else has even bigger tires and even bigger engine. You have to take four steps to get in it, not three or whatever the case may be. A bigger boat, a bigger house. You just came from Disney or you just came from vacation or whatever. Like our vacation was awesome. And you pull up Instagram and everybody else in your neighborhood spent more money, more time somewhere else. And you're like, ugh, what? You can be so okay what you, with what you have until we notice what somebody else has. The devil wants to distract you. Young person, listen to me. The devil wants to distract you for the rest of your life with comparison. And you don't play fair and it never stops. The fastest way to kill something special, even a masterpiece, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. All of a sudden it stops being special because now you start evaluating and you start delineating on stuff that God never meant you to delineate on. Because see, here's the reality. Where comparison begins, contentment ends. 
Some of us are here and we haven't been content in a long time, but it's because we spend all of our time and all of our energy and all of our mind looking at and thinking about and watching what everyone else is doing. And God is saying, if you would stop thinking and focusing on that and you would be the masterpiece I created for the good works I created that I predestined for you to do and not worry about what's going on over there, you could actually find this thing called contentment. You could be okay with less because your eyes are here and not there. See, here's the problem with comparison. Joseph, come on up. Comparison always ends with one or two outcomes. Anytime you compare people, you compare anything, comparison always ends with one of two outcomes, either superiority or inferiority. And neither of those please God. All right. Isn't it awesome when the, <clears throat> your lead pastor brings you back to his home church, knocks it out of the park, and then invites you up to a bunch of people who've never heard you talk, and he's like, don't compare yourself while you do it? That's easy for you to say. You know what I mean? That's easy for you to say. No, it's great to be in Nebraska. I have loved being here. Uh, I thought I was uh, coming to safer areas, a safer place, coming to Nebraska. We're in hurricane season in Florida, and so I'm like, get me out of hurricane season, get me to Nebraska. And I'm met with tornadoes and fire evacuations and pastor hookers. And I'm like, dude, get me out. Get me out. Just take me back to hurricanes, okay? Take me back to the hurricane season. Oh, uh, my goodness. Hey, aren't you excited to be in church this morning, though? Aren't you excited? I love church. I, I grew up in church my whole life, and I just love when a church community comes, and we're about being challenged, and we're about growing, and we're about moving toward Jesus, right? Because if we're not doing those things, then what are we doing? We're just playing patty cake out here, you know, moving and putting our hands together. But we are about growing. We're about challenging ourselves. We're about moving toward Jesus. And I love being a part of a community and getting to show up across the world and right here in Nebraska and said, look at this community that is moving towards Jesus, that is willing to grow beyond just going to the cafe a bunch and growing beyond the waistline. You know what I mean? Come on, somebody. We're growing in a different, in a different way today, but it's so good to be here. I'm going to keep clipping on this comparison aspect. Uh, comparison, Pastor Corey kind of said already, but comparison is always the beginning of the end. Comparison is always the beginning of the end. And I don't think there's a better uh, illustration in the Bible other than uh, David and Saul. And we look at what Saul did with this, this comparison. We can pick it up. I'm going to read just a few verses. It's from 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 5. It says, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing joyful songs and timbrels and lyres as they danced. They sang. They were just throwing an awesome dance party. They had a bunch of beats going on. It was like Khalid and, I don't know, somebody else mixed together. I mean, it was killer, okay? They were putting all types of beats together. And their words they were putting to their beats were, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now, stop right here because David did nothing wrong. David just walked in his purpose. He's like, yo, here we go. Uh, killed tens of thousands. The women did nothing wrong. They was just singing the truth. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And then verse 8, all of a sudden, Saul was very angry. Uh-oh, Saul. This refrain displeased him greatly. And then he says this. This is a quote. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me. With only thousands. But me. Maybe one of the most dangerous phrases we have in our English language. But me. God, they got the nice car, but me. Woo. God, how come she got the promotion, but me. They got the career path going in the right track, but me. They got the house loan, but me. They got, woo, but me. But I. But I. And it always begins, this is where it begins, the end begins with this. It's interesting to me that Saul kept saying, but me. And you know what, David the whole time, Saul was interested in what could please him, but David was interested in what could please God. David didn't care about the but me. It, the issue, that issue was with Saul, but David cared about the presence of God and kept pursuing the presence of God. 
That's the difference. Comparison is always the beginning of the end. This is what Saul got into. And the day you begin to drive in your lane, and as you're driving in your lane, you begin to look over and start to watch their lane, guess what? A collision is sure to happen in the near future. It's sooner or later, and often it's sooner. That's how it goes down. If you want to know if you're dealing with the curse of comparison, as Pastor Corey put it, there are a few ways, there are a few questions you can ask yourself to check out, hey, how do I know if I'm dealing with this? Number one, if you can't celebrate the success of others. They got the promotion. You, you might feel, I, I got the same work ethic. I got the same drive. I got even more humility. Ooh, that, that statement betrayed you. I got even more. I, God, I've been putting it. I, we started tithing double last month. How come you ain't going to give me that promotion? You might have even gotten a demotion, but can you go out of your way and go, you know what? Let me celebrate your success. Woo! If you're stingy with your compliments, are you stingy with your compliments? You get home in front of the mirror and compliment yourself, but then you go out, mm, nobody else got a good looking shirt on, nobody else got nice shoes, nobody else got a good life. Do you see other people with great kids that you wish you would have raised, but you can't say, hey, I love the way your kids turned out? Number three, the last one, if there's anyone in your life, this is my favorite one, if there's anyone in your life that you secretly find joy in their failure. And I love that the, it, secretly, because we're all good Christians, we ain't going to put it out there. But deep down, you know. You know when they get that moment, when they get the opportunity, you are just hoping, waiting to hear them just that they busted. That's like me with Kevin Durant. I just wanted to bust, man. I ain't going to lie about it. I ain't going to lie about it. I love the Golden State's 5-0 and right now without KD. He did nothing. Come on. It could be funny when we talk about the sports analogy. Because there's no context and there's no relationship. But when you're in context and you're in relationship with those people, but deep down inside you're still hoping that they would fail, there's a dangerous curse of comparison that you've attached yourself to. Don't get it twisted. And here's the deal. Just bring it to God. We all deal with it to some extent, to some level. Just learn to be self-aware, diagnose it, see it, and then take it to the Father. How do you know if you live in the curse? That's He's coming back, don't worry. How do you know if you're living in the land of comparison? Because you're actually, you're living in the land of Ur. The land of Ur is how you finish words and sentences. I wish I was smart Ur, rich Ur, strong Ur, funny Ur. See, when you, when you live in the land of Ur, anything Ur has to be compared to something else, which means we're stopped being masterpieces. And we're starting trying to be critics and, and, and we're starting to compare things. Or some of us, you, you've graduated from the land of Ur and you just love to hang out in the land of Est. Big Est, strong Est, rich Est, most powerful Est. I told you there was good news. The good news is uh, this isn't something new and this isn't something Jesus is freaking out about. And here's how I know why. His disciples struggled with this all the time. In fact, if you look at the Gospels, if you step back and you watch it, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated with the story of Jesus and the disciples when you look at the three-year story, not at each, like, scripture and verse. Um, I say this often that um, I don't relate to Jesus. I appreciate Jesus. I'm forever in debt to Jesus. I love what he did. He's my hero. But I have nothing in common with Jesus. But you know what gives me a ton of hope? Those 12 idiots he chose as disciples. <laughs> because when you read the Gospels, if you know the Bible, you know I'm telling you the truth right now. Those bozos could not get out of their own way. And Jesus was like, hey, let's go change the world. And they did. I mean, here's how I know they struggle with comparison. A common story in the gospel says Jesus was walking and behind him an argument broke out about who was the greatest. Who was better. And then he would get to the house. He'd say, so, yo, what were you guys talking about? And they were, yo is um, Latin for behold. Uh, actually Greek, but came from Latin origin. 
He said, yo, what were you guys talking about? They're like, nothing. He's like, well, in case you were wondering how to be the great S, the better er, they were constantly arguing over who's the best. And in fact, if you look, I don't think it's a stretch to say that Peter and John didn't like each other too much. They had this sibling-like rivalry. I'm going to show you in the scripture. And this is, this is hilarious when I learned this. They, in the scripture, there's constantly this almost sibling-like rivalry because Jesus had 12 disciples, but he had these three, Peter, James, and John. And, and first of all, like John didn't help himself out. First of all, he wrote a book after, named after himself. And then he referred to himself in third person. If you, are, if you do that, can I just help you get more friends and tell you to stop it? <laughs> Nobody likes that person who refers to himself in third person. And not only did he refer to himself in third person, but it's what he said. The third person was, he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> he kind of like, the most. <laughs> The, the one whom Jesus loved, oh, the one whom Jesus loved has entered the room. The one whom Jesus loved laid his sh head on his chest at the Last Supper. The one whom Jesus loved, and you know, Peter is not having this. He's like, you know I walk on water, right? Like, come on. <laughs> like, there's, I'm going to show you a couple stories. I, I mean, they, they were constantly going at it. You I mean, it's Peter, and that's, when Jesus gets red, he's like, Cha, you know, chopping the, the guard off. And I just picture John going like, Jesus, I would never do that. In fact, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian, somebody tell me what the single greatest event in history of the world is. That's not a trick question. The resurrection, yeah, thank you, three people are saved in this room. Okay, cool. <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus is the uh, single greatest, most iconic event. It's what we put our whole life's philosophy on, right? John recorded this down, and as he recorded the most important event in history, he made sure three different times he wanted the world to know he's faster than Peter. <laughs> I'm going to show you. In John 20 is the account of Jesus' resurrection, and he reveals himself to women first because they're, we all know they're more trustworthy, and they won't exaggerate as much uh, sometimes. Uh, and so he... The women, Mary and the ladies, are like, Jesus is alive. And they're like, what? watch this. John is about to record the most important thing in history. And he's like, hey, I know people are going to read this forever in every tribe, tongue, and nation for all of the world. So there's a couple of details that I need to make sure I include. So she came. Mary came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. There he goes in third person all up again. The one whom Jesus loved. Ugh. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. This is in John chapter 20. I'm assuming it's behind me or somewhere. I see it. You should see it. Okay. They've taken the Lord. Where they put him? And Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. I picture it being something like this. Like they start walking, and then Peter starts walking a little faster, and then John starts walking a little faster, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, and then we get to verse 4, and it says, and they were running. <laughs> it says this. I'm about to tell you the greatest event in the history, but here's what you need to know first. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. What? Get at me. Two verses later, he's like, in case you missed it, then, only then, did Simon Peter come along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Two verses later. Finally, the other disciple, who also reached the tomb first, also went inside. Three times. Here's two things you need to know about Christianity. Jesus died and rose again for your sins, and John is faster than Peter. That's how that story goes. That's what we take away from this story. But Peter was not going to be outdone because Peter's version of this story would read, well, John stopped at, the, stopped at the tune, but I went all in. I'm an all in kind of guy. He was in behind me. Like, you might have got to the door first, but I crossed the finish line. What? <laughs> Help us, Jesus is right. <laughs> then, it, oh, it, I'm not even done. And this is where it starts to get real, because this is where we see this in our human condition. See, what happens is, uh, what had happened, what had happened was, Jesus, <laughs> ah, if you know, you know. <laughs> see, <laughs> I love, we, uh, we have so much fun in church. Um, we, hey, we have so much fun at our church. We say if we can't have fun, we don't want to do it. Uh, we might have the funnest church in Florida or America, I don't know. Um, when you have five services every week and you got to have fun or you'll kill each other. Um, so see what happened the last time Peter was around Jesus, he denied him three times. It was devastated. 
And so Jesus is going to go out of his way to reinstate Peter to give him one of the most spiritual transformational moments of his life. And so they're fishing, and you see this in the story. They're fishing, and the boat comes in, and like, it's the Lord. And so if you pick up the story in verse 21, Jesus is about to reinstate Peter and give him this crazy moment, spiritual restoration. And, and it's still, this curse of comparison is in here. It's in the text. And so uh, it says uh, in verse tw- uh, 7 of 21, it says, The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! And as soon as Peter heard him say it, he jumped in the water and swam off because he was going to beat John. So I can imagine John's like, well, I saw him first. So Peter's like, well, I swam in. And then it says, Peter, uh, so then here's what happens. And I'm not going to tell the story, but then Jesus does this unbelievable, powerful, transformational story of healing and redemption, similar to the story you heard last week. In this moment where he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes. He said, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. And it's the, now the last time that Jesus, ha- Peter had an opportunity to deny Jesus. He didn't deny him, but he told him he loved him and everything is right and their relationship is restored. And Peter's about to start the church and he's healed and he doesn't have this regret and he doesn't have this shame. And he had this powerful moment at the altar and God showed up and I'm never going to be the same. And watch the very first thing right after a powerful moment with God. Watch the first thing out of Peter's mouth. What about him? Peter just had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life. He went back to fishing. He quit. And Jesus like, get back in the game. Peter's like, yeah, thank you. You're the best. But what, what about him? What about him? Peter, in his most spiritual, transformational, deepest, powerful moment, perhaps, of his life, in the same breath, goes, but what about them? What about, him? What about John? What's, what's going on with John? Like, what's the deal with him? Because you kind of, like, him and I are kind of on the same level. Like, you kind of, like, he says you love him more. I don't know. Watch Jesus' response. Jesus said, hey, if I want him to remain to lie, alive until I return, what is it to you? And then he says this, but as for you, follow me. He reminds Peter where it started. Didn't this start with just you and me? Didn't this just start with you and me? Didn't this start with me walking up and you were fishing? I said, hey, come follow me and I'll make you a fisherman. I'll give you, I'll make you a masterpiece. I pre-designed you for good works. I went ahead of you. Yeah, I have good things for you. Do I have a purpose and a plan for your life? Didn't it just start with you following me? Don't worry about that. There were no other disciples to compare yourself against when this started. Why are you comparing yourself against all the other disciples now? He says, as for you, he took him back to the beginning. He said, if you just, if you just make it about you and me, like it's just you and me. See, sometimes we want to compare, well, God, how come, how come, and uh, you know what God would respond from the text? What is it to you if they have a big family? What is it to you if she gets to be the CEO? What is it to you if their church grows faster than yours? What is it to you? And he doesn't mean it disrespectfully, but he's trying to reset, convince, convict, remind you. He said, hey, this is about you and me. Let's just keep our eyes here. Let's follow Jesus. Because here's the reality. You cannot faithfully follow Jesus if you are always comparing yourself to someone else. You can't follow Jesus faithfully if you're constantly looking in the other lane and you're constantly comparing yourself to somebody else. See, the author of Hebrews wrote about this. We were created and satisfied to be fulfilled in something in heaven, not on earth. And so he writes about this to the Hebrews and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and watch this, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let's go. Let's go to seven. Let's go to eight. Let's just go. There is a race marked out before us. And so how do you combat this curse of comparison? Three words. Run your race. Look at somebody next to you and say, run your race. Now look at your second choice and say, you run your race too. Run your race. Run your race. This is what Ephesians is talking about. You are a masterpiece designed for something specific and unique that I went ahead for, but there's only one person that can run your race. You. You. And most of us are tired and poor and exhausted and almost divorced and a whole bunch of other stuff and want to kill our kids because we have spent everything we have trying to run somebody else's race. And let me tell you something I've learned and I've learned and it's helping me. There is grace to run your race. Listen, but there's only grace to run your race. You don't get that same grace when you jump in somebody else's lane. 
There is a grace to endure and persevere and experience things, to do things that God has set for you. But the minute you try to be somebody else, live somebody else, do somebody else's thing, the God's like, I don't got grace for you over there. Like, I didn't tell you to leave. You got to go. Like, I don't got grace over there. You got to finish your, you got to run your race. You cannot run somebody else's race. God has a race for you to run. But see, here's the hard part. We get, we get comparison and it's hard because we want to please other people, right? Let me just help you. You ain't going to please everybody. But you can please God. So the, the author is saying, don't compare. Don't let comparison sneak in. What about him? How come this? What about that? And Jesus would continue to remind us, hey, just run your race. Run your race. And there's seasons in your life where your race changes. But Jesus is telling you to run your race. Get in your lane. They I was in track. I wasn't fast. I wasn't good. But they let me be on the team. So I went out for track. And they taught, first thing they taught us, the easiest way to slow down, look, look beside. You physically slow down, you can't run. And so many of us are living, we're running life like this. Toss me your phone. Maybe we're not running, but it looks like this. Oh, I didn't know they did this, and I didn't know they were doing that, and I didn't know they were doing that. We need to have that vacation and compare, compare, compare. Listen, social media is not a bad thing. It's being leveraged for a lot of great things. But it is like, a, it is comparison at your fingertips. And we don't, and we don't, we don't compare fair. We compare our everyday life to somebody else's highlight reel. Listen, when you run your race, every day isn't going to be Instagram worthy, but every day will have purpose. And purpose that finds satisfaction and fulfillment and joy trumps anything else you can find in anybody else's race. You were created to run your race and to be satisfied, not by things, but by an, a, a being in heaven who calls you son or calls you daughter. You cannot run somebody else's race. It's impossible. Let me just tell you, if you want to, if you want to guarantee lose, if you want to guarantee lose, you will never win someone else's race. But you can win yours. And there's one way that you can do it, and it's to fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1, in the message version, it's, it's the second part of the verse Pastor Corey was just reading. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. Jesus ran his race and he kept looking and it actually says, uh, he said that he was looking at the Father. He says, I only do that which I see the Father doing. As he's looking at the Father and only doing that, and then we get to look at Jesus and only do that, and it keeps working how it's supposed to Work, But so often, I believe we take our eyes off of Jesus, we take our eyes off of, off of our purpose, and we begin to place our eyes onto our potential. And when we put our eyes on our potential, comparison is soon to follow. Because we're looking and we start to do the errs and the s, and we start to look at it and we start to go, oh, but I could, I could, Jesus, they're reaching their potential over there and they look like they're hitting their potential over here and you've just got me over here. And you could imagine Noah, the, Noah, the dude who built the ark, it, says, it took him, uh, they estimate that it took him about 40 to 55 years to build an ark. And could you imagine Noah sitting there going, God, you got this dude over here and he's using his skill to build and he's monopolizing it and he's using his talents and abilities and they're making tons of money. And why don't you have me doing over here, but you just have me nailing down a boat in the middle of a drought. But Noah was convicted and kept moving forward in his purpose, not worried about his potential. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff. God didn't call us to be important or to strive toward our potential, he called us to be faithful and stride toward our purpose. He called us to be faithful and strive toward our purpose. Uh, back when I was younger, I got the uh, PS3 given to me. It was because they gave my first one away. I was a saint, I know. Uh, but uh, they gave me this, this PS3, and they gave me a video game with it. Uh, it was a terrible video game. It was amazing. It was, it was terrible. It was amazing. It was terrible. It was amazing. Uh, 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 it was Assassin's Creed. Uh, and... Um, it was amazing. I got to get all my inner rage as a teenager out uh, through Assassin's Creed. And, and uh, so you, I'm running around in this video game. I just got it. I load it up. I put it in there. I'm like, yeah, let's go. And I'm running. I'm jumping from rooftops. I'm pulling guys into hay, hay bales. All you hear is like, Whoosh. you know, that's what you hear, okay? If you know, you know. Um, but we're just going crazy on this thing. And I'm, I'm going for three days. I'm, like I said, I'm, on, I'm jumping through rooftops. I'm killing guards. I'm killing innocent people. It was terrible. Uh, jumping off of, uh, you get uh, up onto these eagle nests and you jump off and you 
can land in these hay bales. I mean, I'm just going crazy. I've racked up a huge body count. It was incredible, right? And then all of a sudden, I see this button in the right-hand corner. It says objective. I was like, oh, there's an objective. I pushed the button. An objective list comes out. And I found out I was two cities further than where I was supposed to be. So I get to eventually, I just, I, okay, okay, I could do that. So I get on my horse. I walk right through the places where I was fighting before. I didn't have to jump on any rooftops. I just walked right through. I got to the destination. I opened the door, got to the person, talked to the person, and they handed me the scroll in the game, which was the next objective. See, this is the difference between living in your potential and living in your purpose. Your potential will have you running all around like your head's cut off. It will have you looking at people like they're threats. That were never meant to be a threat to your life. And oftentimes when we start to walk in our potential or try to strive for our potential, when we're striving for that potential, we're reaching for it, you know what we do? We leave a wake of damage behind us. And oftentimes it's people's lives. But when we stride, when we walk in our purpose, we're able to walk through the things we used to view as threats. The damage is not left behind us. And we arrive at the destination because we're able to walk right through what we once viewed as threat. Jesus didn't come to fulfill his potential. He came to be obedient in his purpose. Jesus didn't come to fulfill his potential. He came to be obedient in his purpose. Jesus' potential was to speak planets out of his mouth. Jesus' potential on earth was to be Caesar in Rome. But his purpose was to die on a cross. Your purpose might not make sense to the rest of society. Your purpose will not make sense to the rest of society. When you walk in your purpose, you should either be being promoted or being demoted because society can't make sense of it. That's a word. You can fact check that through the Bible, by the way. Walk in your purpose. Stop striving for your, for your potential. I love that verse. Jesus says, I only do that which I see the Father do. And that is our purpose. Our objective, our purpose, I could help us out. Our objective, our purpose is Jesus. It is a relationship with Jesus. And when we begin to draw near to Jesus, all of a sudden our purpose comes to life. It doesn't have to feel like I'm just building an ark for 40 to 55 years. It, it looks like, oh, I am doing something purposeful. And by the way, if we track with that, uh, Noah ended up being the bridge for mankind. Jesus ended up being the savior of mankind. Walk in your purpose. Don't worry about what's left and don't worry about what's right. Because if I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, then we ain't looking at Jesus and we missed it a long time ago. It was just a few weeks ago I had, uh, I, I do these football devotions. I'm a team chaplain for two of the local high school football teams. And I do these team devotions on Fridays. And this Friday I was going to miss. And so uh, normally I give it to somebody in-house. But a few weeks ago I felt like God put somebody else. There's a local youth pastor in my area who's actually pretty good at what he does. And God said, hey, um, let him do the devotion. I was like, hey, no, God, I, I want those football players to come to my youth group. I'm doing the work. I'm putting in the time. I'm the humble one. Okay, come on, somebody. <laughs> that ain't about to happen. I ain't hearing Jesus. I must have drank too much allergy medicine last night. Okay? Uh, so, uh, but, but it kept stirring in me. So I said, okay, God, you know, so I, I, I set it up, and I set him up for success, by the way. We took time on the phone where I said, do this and do this and don't do that and don't do that. So I didn't just give him the spot. I set him up for success. Don't manipulate it, people. And so I uh, set him up, and he gets in there on Friday, and he crushes it, and he texts me after. He said, dude, that went so well. And I was like, I'm so happy for you. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I was so happy. I was like, dude, that's awesome. I'm so happy. That's, that's exciting. And then he texts me, and he says, I had a student that used to come to my group three or four years back. And he's walked away from the Lord, and he's gotten into all types of messes. And he came up to me after the devotion in tears. And he said, I don't know where I've been, but I've walked way off the mark. And I want to come back to Jesus. 
can I come to your group on Wednesday night? Listen, if I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, we're not looking at Jesus, and it stops becoming about Jesus. But let me tell you, it is about Jesus. It always has been about Jesus, and it always will be about Jesus. And when we set our course and our eyes on him and start striding in our purpose, come on. It's really simple. How do you run your race? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. If my eyes are here, here's the unique thing about your eyes. They can only be in one place at a time. You ever think about that? You can only look at one thing at a time. So if your eyes are on Jesus, you can't compare. But if you compare, you can't have your eyes on Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey, fix your eyes on me. Make it about me, my relationship with you. I'm the one that's going to make you feel okay about yourself, not anything else. I'm the one that's going to make you satisfy that longing and fulfillment that you're looking for with external things that can only be felt and fulfilled by me. So a couple questions as we close. Sue, you can come play as we wrap up. We're not going to respond or anything, just want you to reflect. How? Let me ask you this question. If you were to be really courageously honest with yourself today, Whose race are you comparing your race to? Who's running in a lane that you wished you were running in? And God would say lovingly to you today, there's grace for them on that race, and there's grace for you in your race. Run your race. Get your eyes on Jesus. Another question to consider. If you're really courageously honest with yourself today, where are you looking or what are you doing to, to find your worth? To really feel valued, to feel valuable. Because here's what the author knew when he wrote, is that when you fix your eyes on Jesus, that's when you discover that, that you are his masterpiece. When you spend time with him in his word and in prayer, when you let him tell you who you are and you believe the scripture about yourself and you say those things over yourself and your children and your spouse, you start to live like God's masterpiece. And when you are God's masterpiece, you don't walk around arrogant because you know everybody else is a masterpiece too and so you treat them the same. You don't got to compare, you just appreciate. It's a really, it's really fun place to be in your life where you can celebrate other people's victories even if it's one you wish you had. Where you can be happy for somebody who has something you want and you don't have. That's what God wants for us. So, are you running your race? Are you running your race? Are you really running your race? Or are you trying to run somebody else's? Are you trying to dress a certain way, look a certain way, have a certain career path, have a certain whatever, so, you, you, because they look good on social media when they do it, or in church, or in school, or at work, and so you're convinced if you can get it, you'll look and feel just as good, and only to realize that there, it only works when you're in your lane, and God says, just keep your eyes on me. Just find your purpose. Strive for your purpose. A lot of this has to do with identity and insecurity. I don't got to tell you about that. Pastor Andy told you about that a couple weeks ago. But today, I just want to talk about the curse of comparison. And maybe, just maybe some of us would be convinced enough to stop looking on social media, stop looking across the desk, stop looking as much in the sense of comparison and start fixing our eyes on Jesus and go, Jesus, thank you for re realigning my perspective. Note, remember Jesus' response to, to, to Peter. Don't worry about him. As for you, follow me. Just follow me. Just follow he doesn't, he doesn't, how dare you? He doesn't, I can't believe you're comparing again. He doesn't, I can't believe you're still arguing about who's the greatest. He doesn't do anything. He just says, hey, don't worry about that. As for you, let me just remind you of where this all started. Because see, here's what Jesus remembered. Peter, didn't this start with you doing something else and me going, hey, follow me? Didn't it just start with you and me? Maybe Jesus wants to take some of you back to where this started. And the striving for everything else. And you just need to know that God made you to fulfill your purpose. Can I pray for you? Bow your heads if you would. God, to say I love this place would be an understatement. To say I love these people would be an understatement. This place has shaped me and my family is for who we are. And God, I, I, it's not lost on me that I get to preach a message on a stage and in a room where you taught me how to run my race. Where I learned how to fix my eyes on you. Where I, I dealt with a lot of my comparisons and my pains and my insecurities 
and I'm not there, but, but God, I pray for the same miracle in, in, in the lives of people who are struggling with comparison, who are trying to run somebody else's race or are super distracted. God, I come against and I break down distractions. I break down walls of comparison in Jesus' name. God, I, I just sense even in this service that there is, there is almost a spirit of insecurity that is just, just paralyzing certain people. And I just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that, that we would stop comparing and then leading to such a false sense of security, but we would just adopt and believe and trust that we are who you say we are and that we were worth dying for and you did do it for us and you want a relationship with us. So God, I pray that we would get back in our lane, that we would get our eyes back on you and that we would stride towards our purpose. God, would you bless every person, every child, every family that's represented? Would you bless this church? God, would, would you do more? Would you continue to use this as a light in your city, God? And I pray that this church is an organization, that these families that are here and these individuals, that we would be content with the race that you've set before us. Let us experience the grace that you have for us to run our race. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, to say it's awesome to be back is also an understatement. I love you guys. Thanks for giving us a few minutes of your time today. God bless you guys. We'll see you next year.